And now I want to bring up to the stage our very first speaker. And I was so, you know, when we were sending out uh, with the conference content committee this year to decide who would be the opening speaker, there was really only one person that came to mind. It was the number one person that we wanted to uh, come speak and, and open G Summit for the, us this year. And it's, of course, a man who's been incredibly inspirational, changed the lives of millions of people with his incredible game designs. And, um, you know, without making too big of a deal out of it, I know you hear this literally like every day of your life, but of course changed my life. I spent, I have spent personally thousands of hours playing the things that uh, Will Wright has designed um, and the games that he's made like SimCity, The Sims, uh, Spore, um, Sim Tower, which I was kind of obsessed with. Um, these games have transformed the world. They've changed how we feel about complexity of data and what people are willing to do, how people think about the ideas of simulation, about discovery, um, even to some extent about how we feel about the world around us, how much SimCities influence how real world city people manage their cities. Uh, it, it's so big, it kind of just blows your mind immediately. I, so, and I have to say that with a, a great deal of affection, excitement, and enthusiasm, I'm pleased to introduce you to our opening keynote speaker, Mr. Will Wright. Thank you, buddy. I want to thank Gabe for inviting me to give the keynote here. Uh, I tend to think of the keynote speech as something that just sets the tone for the rest of the conference, something that's kind of fairly general. So I'm going to do my best not to give you any practical advice whatsoever this morning. Um, now we're here, obviously, talking about gamification, which I have to kind of say right off the bat, I hate this word. I mean, it's just unwieldy. It sounds painful, doesn't it? You know, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to gamify your website. Uh, but really, you know, there are so many other approaches that have been taken, you know, kind of through different forms of media for different purposes to get people engaged. Uh, gamification, you know, is kind of the more recent one. I think that we see games and the power that games have over people, and it's pretty amazing, you know, how engaged people get. Um, how much it actually kind of makes them care about the experience. You know, when you look at, you know, anybody that really gets into a good game, uh, they're really into it. You know, you can kind of tell that that's where their mind is. And they're, you know, just the way they think about games, I think, you know, they become very important to them uh, for a number of reasons that I want to kind of go into a little bit today. So we're kind of looking at what happens, you know, with things where people maybe don't care so much about. Uh, how can we use games to kind of increase the engagement that people have with these things? You know, so I'm sure there's a better term for it, but uh, I guess we'll stick with gamification for now. When I was doing Maxis, uh, you know, we came out with SimCity many years ago, and then we did a lot of other games, SimEarth, SimAnt. Um, at some point, we started being approached by all these different people, kind of with different companies, different agencies, and they saw what we were doing, basically making games about reality. And, you know, they all came to us kind of with their own thing, whatever it was, saying, can you make a game out of it, no matter what the subject was. Uh, and it was kind of interesting. Um, they tended to think of games as like this secret ingredient, you know, that if we could just kind of add games to this thing, it all of a sudden would be fun and compelling. They also kind of had this model in their head of the way we approach things. They kept referring to our simulation engine, like we had this magic engine that we would just attach to something, and it would take whatever experience they had and make it really cool and interesting. Uh, of course, you know, we're dealing with just a massive, you know, amount of code. Every simulation that we built was unique, you know, for that game. So there was no engine. It was actually more of an approach, the way we would think about it. Take any subject, try to figure out how do we abstract this in an interesting way to where people can come in and make it a playful toy. Uh, I think, you know, there's really no magic ingredient. What a lot of people kind of do, though, is they'll look at features of games and they'll say, what if we just kind of mix all these different things that we see in games into a pot and then maybe we'll have a cool experience. But it doesn't really work that way, obviously. You know, you can kind of think of, you know, movies that you've seen. And they're very common scenes, cliches, stereotypes, people sitting in a cafe talking, gunfights, uh, you know, the doctor that stays up all night doing research to solve the crime, you know, romantic kisses, car chases, aliens popping out and attacking you unexpectedly. You know, these are all things that you've kind of seen in movies, elements of movies. But if you were to string these together into a movie, you know, obviously, you know, randomly stringing these things together is not going to give you a good movie. It's going to give you like a, you know, the, in the story is something that you feel and experience rather vicariously. Now, games are kind of a totally different mechanism in your brain. Games are really based upon the idea of agency, the idea that you're going in and touching, driving the experience, that, you know, you have control over what's happening. Uh, a lot has been said about games that they have kind of a very limited emotional palette. 
Um, I don't really think that's true. I think what games have is a different emotional palette than stories. I never felt guilty or proud watching you know, a movie, but I have played games. So I think that there are things that you can get in games emotionally and kind of uh, just in terms of the way you engage somebody and get them to care about what they're doing. They're totally different than stories, but you have to understand the kind of relationship between the two. Uh, in some sense, we're all kind of born into this world and we have a limited bubble of experience. You know, from this limited experience, we're building models of the way the world works around us. Now, it is a very limited set of experiences that we've had, so we've actually found ways to supplement that limited experience. One of them is through having toy experiences, kind of symbolic experiences. Another one is learning through the experience of others. Somebody can come up and tell us a story, and then we can learn and abstract and build a more accurate world model based upon what they've told us. Um, over time, we've called one of these play and the other one story. But they're both, I think, fundamentally educational technologies that basically evolved you know, a long, long time ago for us to build more accurate models of the world around us. Uh, there's actually a guy named James Paul Gee uh, who, if you're not familiar with his work, I would very much encourage you to kind of check into it. He's actually looked at the principles of good education and then shown how games really incorporate all these principles very, very effectively, much more so than traditional education. Uh, it's actually kind of interesting just all the different kind of ways in which you can look at games and show the way that they're actually one of the most effective ways for somebody to build an accurate world model or a model of what you want them to build. And so a game designer, a lot of that is really about building that model. Now games really are a subset of what we call play. Uh, you can give a kid a ball, they can sit there and bounce the ball around, and they can kind of learn physics, they can kind of learn aspects of what they're playing with. You know, games really just put a little bit more structure around that. You put some rules, uh, goal states around that, and you have a game. So games really uh, involve the player going in within a rule set and making kind of interesting decisions, you know, toward a specific goal. I think Sid Meier said this, that games, a good game really is putting the player in a position where they're making an interesting set of decisions along the way. Now, in a game, you're exploring, you know, basically what I call a possibility space. All the different directions you can go inside that game. Now, one of the cool things about games is that you can start over at the beginning and replay it. So that gives you the opportunity to go back to the possibility space and take a different path through there and over time start mapping that space in your head. Now that's something that we don't really get in reality. And that's what makes games kind of interesting as toy experiences is the fact that we can kind of start at the very beginning and then take a different path and remap that landscape. That's one of the fundamental differences between stories and games. Uh, stories really, you're putting a person on a very specific predestined kind of arc. Uh, in games, it's more like we're giving them a vehicle where they can kind of freely explore. The most interesting stories I've actually heard gamers tell are stories that they've experienced in games that were unique to them. Uh, it's not that, you know, we've all seen the same cutscene or rescued the same princess, but it's the fact that somebody's had a very unique experience, and that's the story that they want to go tell. So I don't really think of games as a storytelling medium. I think of games as a story creation medium for the player. And really, we're building that landscape as game designers, and we're trying to build an interesting landscape, you know, with twists and turns, challenges, you know, failures. Uh, that really is the essence of games. Even when you're watching a movie, though, I think in some sense you're mapping that possibility space. When you think of Indiana Jones running out of the temple and all these traps going off, in your mind, you're actually kind of imagining, what if you fell in that pit? What if that thing rolled over him? So in some sense, you are actually mapping that possibility space, even though you're put on one specific path through it in the movie. Now, games have been around a very, very long time. Uh, the oldest game that we know of is this Egyptian game, Sinet. Uh, but the modern kind of uh, era of gamification really started back with the Prussians in the mid-1800s. Uh, there was a Prussian general that kind of came up with this uh, thing called the Army War Game. And uh, he actually intended it as a training mechanism for the generals, the Prussian generals. And it caught on very, very fast. You know, first of all, the generals were you know, very competitive. They loved kind of playing this against each other. But also it allowed them to kind of experiment and try different strategies. Uh, and it wasn't long before all the major armies in Europe adopted this. Uh, and they found it to be one of the most effective training tools, you know, kind of for what they were doing. Now, when you think about a kid playing a game, or even an adult uh, around anything, it's kind of interesting. Uh, even at a young age, you know, a kid basically is exhibiting the scientific method. They'll pick up the controller, they'll start pushing buttons on it, they'll observe what's happening, and based upon what they see happening, they'll start building a model of the way the game works. Uh, they will refine that model by trying different things, different strategies in the game. Um, as they experience more failure, more success, uh, they start refining that model over time. It's very much kind of a cycle of kind of hypothesis, experiment, observe the result, refine the model. So it is pretty much the scientific method that, you know, basically even a six-year-old is kind of naturally drawn to, you know, in terms of playing games. 
and it's amazingly effective. Now science really is kind of the process of taking a huge amount of data, compressing it down into a very, very simple, concise set of rules. Uh, in some sense, um, that's what gamers are doing. They're kind of looking at the data as they play the game. And it's what scientists are doing as well. Uh, this is a scientist, uh, Scott Didums. Uh, he works at uh, the Institute of Standards and Technology. Here he's actually doing experiments in quantum optical interactions. And he's doing this to kind of build a more accurate physics model of the way modern physics works. Um, this is Timmy. Uh, he's a toddler at Carolina Day School. Uh, here he's kind of playing with little toy magnets, looking at the way they interact. Um, he's doing the exact same thing, though. He's using this to build a comprehensive world model of physics. Uh, it's the exact same process that these two individuals are going through. And it's something that we're actually kind of born into. I think it's a more natural mode of interaction for us than story, which is something that we learn a little bit later. Uh, and, you know, very, very young kids will sit there, interact with the world, start building models through play. Um, games really, in some sense, you know, as a game designer, what we're doing is we're trying to build a very concise set of rules that will create a very large set of possibilities for the player, especially in simulation games. Now, the player is actually kind of interacting, you know, in this large, you know, simulation. And in that, they're trying to reverse engineer our rule set. They're actually building a mental model of what they think uh, is underneath the hood of that game. And so in some sense, that's what games really are doing. They're actually building mental models. Games are really just compilers, I think, for mental models that we want to put in the player. Uh, and depending on how we design that game, we can kind of direct what kind of model they're building. Now, over time, as they play the game, they actually we want to give them a handle to start with, a very simple model that they can kind of approach the game and understand how it basically works. But over time, as they're playing the game, they're actually kind of building a more complex model. This modeling, by the way, actually starts all the way back, you know, if it's a retail package sitting on the shelf for a game, they look at the box, and right off the bat, they're looking at that box, and they're kind of imagining, oh, what would that game be about? And they're actually playing the game in their imagination. Uh, so that game that they imagine that your game might be is actually uh, initially played in their imagination, and if it's interesting enough in their imagination, they might pick up the box and turn it over, um, or go to the website and download it, uh, and then actually start playing it. So this modeling process starts before they even actually play the game. Uh, once they start playing the game, there are different kind of interaction loops, nested loops of interaction. You know, at first you kind of pick up the controller, and maybe you're pushing the buttons and seeing how Mario jumps around, uh, and it takes you a few seconds to figure out how to control Mario. Um, once you figure out how to control Mario, at first you don't know how to control him. Once you figure it out, you now kind of work your way up to the next level, which is now I'm interacting with things on a longer time scale. Uh, now I'm dealing with, you know, the mushrooms or, you know, turtles, whatever there are in Mario. Uh, again, you know, I hit a kind of pattern of fail, fail, fail at first, kind of figure that out, and then get to the next level. So games really are a set of nested interactions over time that each involve you building kind of a more accurate model of the underlying system, but they also involve kind of a uh, success-failure uh, stage for each. There's this nested complexity that we're kind of presenting the player with um, over time. In a game like The Sims, this is kind of what the nests look like. You know, at first you don't know how to control the character. You learn to control them, move them around, have them interact with objects. Then you start dealing with their basic needs, you know, and it, you know, they're peeing on the floor, they're starving, whatever it is. Um, every time you get success. Now, what's kind of counterintuitive about this uh, that I found continually is that players actually spend more time and have more enjoyment on the failure side of this than the success. You know, once you've succeeded the game, it's kind of boring. But uh, the failure is actually what players really enjoy. Now, it's important that they understand why they're failing, so that they want to go back and kind of try it again. Um, and it's also important that the failure be interesting and varied and presented in kind of an interesting, fun way. But really, that's what players are hopefully spending 80% of their time in your game failing, basically, and achieving their goals. Uh, so in some sense, you know, as game makers, what we're doing, you know, we're not just kind of handing somebody a game, you know, for entertainment and experience for money. In some sense, what we're actually doing is handing them a set of problems. Here's a set of problems. Pay me money for these problems. Hopefully, you'll have fun solving them. Uh, now, these problems, you know, depending on the complexity of the game, have a different uh, size solution space, which are, you know, what are all the different ways in which I can solve the problems within this game? Uh, some simple games, like puzzle games, have one specific solution. Everybody's going to find the exact same solution to a puzzle. Uh, other games, like chess, board games, you know, have a much larger solution space. There are a lot of different ways to win a game of chess. As we get into more open-ended design games, you know, it's truly just huge amounts of solution space. And that's kind of interesting. You know, players actually are very good at intuiting how open-ended a game is. Uh, when you put a player in a game, within five minutes, they can just kind of poke around in there and get a sense that this is a very open-ended game, you know, very expressive. It's almost like when you put a wild animal in a cage, they walk around the perimeter and figure out where the fence is, what are the boundaries of the uh, possibility space or solution space within the system. 
I remember the first time I played Grand Theft Auto, it took me about five minutes to realize how open-ended of a game that was. And it was kind of interesting that with that limited of an interaction, I was able to go in and get a sense for how large that possibility space was in the game. As game designers, we're actually engineering this kind of possibility space. Uh, a game like The Sims, really, we were kind of imagining it uh, as having these different balances between material success, social success, um, with local maxima on either extreme. If you actually were to balance the material with the social, you would actually achieve the highest level of success in the game. Um, we were actually able to measure this through metrics, watching people play the game, thousands of players playing the game over hundreds of sim days, and get a sense of kind of what the bottlenecks the players were experiencing, where they were actually fanning out, where they were converging. Uh, this more and more is becoming one of the chief tools, and one of the really interesting properties of games is the fact that we can me measure player performance, uh, player interest, and player behavior, you know, at very detailed levels. So we're kind of ramping this model up in the player's mind. Uh, one of the ways we do that is kind of through metaphor. Uh, this is something that's, you know, been around, you know, in modern computers forever, where we basically use what you already know to help you kind of bootstrap you into some new system. Uh, you know, in a lot of games, it's kind of an obvious. The Sims is a metaphor of a dollhouse. You're kind of dealing with these dolls, but they're alive and they have autonomy. Uh, something like SimCity uh, is actually, um, oh, I think my clicker is going crazy. Back up a little bit here. Something like SimCity, really, the metaphor is more of that of a train set. Um, when you first come in, you're kind of building this little world, you know, putting down buildings, et cetera. But there's really a deeper underlying metaphor for a lot of these games. In SimCity, once you start playing it for a while, you start realizing it's actually more like gardening. You're fertilizing, you're growing, you're weeding. Uh, really, it's about maintaining this over time as you go through. Now, you know, there's a lot of talk and has been for many years about human-centered design, user-centered design. Uh, games really, I think, have been at the forefront of that. You know, games really want to be totally focused on the player, uh, especially nowadays. I mean, that's kind of the trend. That's people, what people expect is that this is all about me. Um, now, there was a quote that was actually attributed to uh, Barnum many years ago. It actually was uh, quoted by this other guy, H.L. Mencom. Uh, I think there's a kind of a game design version of that, uh, which is that, you know, we should always remember that the more we can kind of focus on the player, the more the game is about you, uh, then the more interested you're going to be in it. Um, really, that's what's going to engage you more than anything else very effectively. Uh, one of the ways we do that is actually by increasing the uh, possibility space within the game. Making the games more open-ended means that there could be much more unique paths through that game, and that the game in some sense now becomes a reflection of who you are. Uh, and once it's a reflection of who you are, it's something that you want to share, and it becomes kind of a social experience. So really, by making games have a larger solution space, larger possibility space, making them more open-ended, what we're actually doing is we're allowing players to reflect more of themselves in the experience and making more of the experience about them. Um, another way to kind of think about this is that uh, we want games to kind of make players feel, you know, like this is something that is kind of rewarding them. Uh, one thing that we always do as game designers is we try to engineer an early win. You know, how within the first, you know, two or three minutes of playing the game do they get some success? And usually we put in something just incredibly simple and then we kind of celebrate that success. And it kind of releases this little dopamine in your brain and then you kind of want to try it again and it just kind of gets you hooked. And really it's the first five minutes for almost any game that is the biggest challenge. Uh, you also, of course, want to showcase, you know, their accomplishments in interesting ways. Uh, as well as make them feel like, you know, when they're playing this game, that they're kind of in the groove, that, you know, this is kind of what they were born to do. Uh, there are a lot of kind of intangible ways in which we do this, but the games that I found myself really addicted to were things that I remember in the first five minutes, I was hooked. Uh, it wasn't something that I had to play for two or three hours to get hooked on, but right off the bat, you know, I was in this cycle of kind of reward success uh, after, you know, failure that was interesting to me that really kind of got me hooked into the game. Um, if you can get a player to play a game just a little bit longer, you know, they actually talk to their friends about it. It's on their mind. They kind of spread it as a meme more effectively. It's that kind of interesting if you look at uh, just, you know, viral infections, you know, actual real viruses. If you double the contagious period of any disease, the amount of people that end up being infected are uh, it's tremendously higher. It's a huge leverage point. Um, so if you can get somebody to play your game twice as long, the amount of exposure they're going to give to other people in talking about it uh, can be, you know, compound on that, just a tremendously more kind of viral spread. Now, also, we have to kind of imagine, as we're looking at how we kind of make players feel good, how we're kind of preying on their self-esteem, different player types. Uh, these are Bartles types, which you may have heard of, which is uh, kind of a game design thing about different types of players that we see in games. You know, some are more kind of uh, engaged in the world that they're in. Uh, other ones are kind of more engaged in the people that are playing alongside of them. 
Uh, some of them tend to be more competitive. Some of them tend to be more social. Each one of these player types kind of has different kind of care and feeding instructions. That as game designers, we try to put enough diversity in the game to where each one of these player types feels rewarded through the experience. Now, as we look to the future, uh, you know, the future has always been kind of an interest to me. But in game design, this is something that's happening just so fast that the future is just unfolding right before our eyes here. Um, now, you know, we used to think of the future as, you know, this cool thing that's way off in the distance and all these kind of weird things are going to appear that we can hardly imagine today. Uh, but in some sense, the future is becoming less and less predictable over time. You know, I think, you know, back in the 1700s, people could have looked 100 years ahead and had a pretty good idea of what they'd be doing, what the world would be like. Um, in the 1800s, I think they'd, you know, still kind of be fairly close to the mark in terms of the advances that were ahead of them. Um, if we kind of fast forward uh, to today, I don't think we have any clue what it's going to be like 100 years from now. Uh, you know, the world might be gone through global warming, it might be this Star Trek utopia, who knows. But in some sense, the future uh, is coming at us faster and faster. This is kind of the whole singularity thing. Um, in our field, in game design, you know, we had this predictable kind of console cycle going for a few decades. Uh, every four or five years, a new console would come out. You know, better graphics, more advanced AI. Uh, basically, there was this kind of slow, gradual, you know, uptick of technology, uh, you know, game design, innovation, et cetera. And in the last five years or ten years, it's kind of exploded for a number of reasons. Um, you know, the games industry is kind of fragmenting into a million different bits. Uh, part of that is just, you know, the platforms, but also the technology. You know, in some sense, games uh, to computers have always been the same way that auto racing is to autos. Games have driven the technology of computers in interesting ways. Uh, the interfaces, the output, the graphics, et cetera. Um, this is something that's happening in other media as well. If you kind of go back, you know, to movies like Wizard of Oz, it was really designed for one format. It was designed to be, you know, viewed in a theater on, you know, 35 millimeter film. Over time, you know, the different ways in which you could kind of view this experience have kind of expanded. This is the platform expansion, you know, that in movies, you know, happened over maybe 80 years. In games, it's happening right before our eyes over a period of about a decade. So we're dealing with, you know, kind of this platform explosion right before our eyes uh, in games. Um, not just in the technology platforms, but also uh, the different cultures that are playing our games is getting much more diverse very rapidly. We're selling games all around the world. Other markets, developing markets, are exploding right before our eyes. Uh, but also the demographics of our players. We're not just selling to 16-year-old boys anymore. Uh, we're dealing with everybody, you know, grandparents, little kids, uh, different genders. You know, the amount of women playing games is tremendous compared to what it used to be. Um, and the things around us, you know, things that, you know, used to be very specific uh, appliances around us are all evolving into entertainment platforms. Uh, in some sense, we're becoming surrounded by just opportunities to have games and gaming around us. Um, now, in games, we used to kind of have this idea of immersive gaming, that, you know, really the best games are ones where I'm sitting there in the dark playing Doom and the whole world disappears around me. Uh, but now we're kind of getting into this era of non-immersive gaming, games that kind of come out into the world with us. We're actually taking gaming metaphors and applying them, you know, through television, through the world around us, and we're about to bring that out into the world. You know, we've already got these smartphones, you know, and pretty soon we're going to start having, you know, perhaps various headgear, things like that, where we can intersect the games with the reality around us, you know, basically having a blended reality that we're dealing with. Uh, the opportunities this is bringing up are just kind of astounding, you know, as, you know, reality now becomes our gaming platform. Um, in some sense, gaming now can become a lens on reality. When you think of uh, photography, you know, I got a digital camera many years ago and I found that I had a lot of fun just kind of taking weird pictures. But I found that my digital camera was really like training wheels for my eye. You know, as I was carrying a camera around, I started seeing the world in interesting ways and just seeing different perspectives of pictures I wanted to take because of the immediacy of the feedback. Uh, but pretty soon I didn't need the camera. I could just kind of throw the camera away and I could still walk around the world and see the world in a different way because of the experience I had looking for cool photos with my camera. Now these smartphones are allowing us to kind of update all of our friends, stay amazingly connected uh, in time. But now they're also understanding where we are. Um, pretty soon by looking at the sensors, they can understand exactly what we're doing, the activities we're engaged in. Uh, we're on the verge of them being able to just sit there and listen and understand who we're with and what we're talking about, what the subject of conversation with, as well as seeing everything that we see. You know, and this is all kind of going into this giant pile of big data. Uh, that's going to allow games kind of a really interesting opportunity here to where rather than something that we go off and do, you know, instead of real life and playing games, they actually intersect real life. They become merged with real life. And I think really the future of gaming and play is going to be deeply personal as these, you know, games through these devices learn more about us than perhaps we even know about ourselves or our friends know about us. Um, also very relevant to everything we do in the world, uh, not just some distraction where we're going off 
rescuing some uh, fictitious princess, ubiquitous, basically around us everywhere at any time, always having opportunities to interact with these things, uh, and very effective, you know, in terms of having, helping us achieve real goals that we want to do, whether they're educational, aspirational, uh, or whatever. Uh, but most importantly, I think that they have the opportunity to kind of make our lives and the world around us more fun, more playful, and keep us kind of really more engaged in reality rather than distracting us from it. So um, I'm going to stop there, and I went over time. But thank you very much.